Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. We do not believe that he got a fair shake at any point in time. So-called sex cult leader Keith Raniere is recovering from COVID-19 in prison. The defense attorneys preparing his appeal. There are more pieces to each one of these stories. We're not downplaying the allegations. A California man accused of murdering his estranged wife is now accused of threatening a prosecutor and his family. The defense disagrees. I do not believe that he was in danger. The trial of a Wisconsin man charged with killing his wife abruptly put on hold while a judge recovers. Judge Hinkfus slipped and fell last night, returning home from work. We'll tell you when testimony is set to resume. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Convicted sex cult leader Keith Raniere is recovering from COVID-19 as his defense prepares their appeal. He started exhibiting symptoms, endured a full-blown COVID-19 uh, breakout, if, if you will, or shakes, fevers, the whole nine yards. Criminal defense attorney Joseph McBride represents Keith Raniere. McBride, a frequent guest on the Law and Crime Network, believes Raniere contracted COVID-19 being transferred between prisons from New York to Arizona. Our team had previously requested from the district court for Mr. Raniere to be able to stay back uh, on the East Coast so that his defense team could have access to him. Raniere is serving a 120-year sentence for sex trafficking and racketeering. Prosecutors say the self-help guru known as Vanguard recruited celebrities and socialites in his company called Nexium, then forced women to act as sex slaves. Ranieri really, you know, twisted people's trust in their need to find uh, some meaning and hope in their lives uh, in, in just the most insidious and devious ways. Raniere has a new team of attorneys, including McBride, Jennifer Bojan, who's also leading Bill Cosby's appeal, and Stephen Metcalf. They say they have grounds to overturn his conviction and sentence. You have a legitimate business that's operating with hundreds of people who are benefiting from it and are actually gaining tremendous life experiences as a result of it and employed, and all of a sudden that becomes deemed a federal RICO? That federal RICO, the charges that could relate to sex trafficking charges, 100% tainted the entire proceedings going forward, from the beginning to the end, it had chilling effects on the defense that could have been presented or that Keith could have presented. You're talking about a person that over 15 victims came forward to testify against, five of women in his inner circle pled guilty to, to him exchanging sexual favors in Nexium, his company, with these women and branding some of them and the allegations of, I'm gonna keep this piece of video of you uh, to blackmail you in one way or another, that's not people's feelings, I would argue. That's just w what came out. I, I don't see how that's like interpreted differently. Yeah, but Brian, those, those weren't used to, as part of, of the government's proof. Those were used as a part of showing and establishing restitution and how that ultimately led a judge to sentence this man to 120 years. So that impacted even the judge's view and ultimately led to that sentencing. Th the evidence presented at trial to produce and substantiate these charges was completely different than those victim impact statements. And that's what we are claiming was lacking at the trial level. Actress Allison Mack and Seagram Liquor's heir Claire Bronfman both pled guilty to their roles in the group. As for Raniere, the court already imposed a $1.75 million fine and prosecutors are seeking additional restitution for victims. His crimes and the crimes of his co-conspirators ruined marriages, careers, fortunes, and lives. There are a lot of questions. There are a lot of holes. We have a lot of questions about uh, the FBI's work in this case, people here were hurt on some level. The, but the, the question is about criminality. The question is about proving each element of each crime beyond a reasonable doubt. We don't think that the government did that in this case. Um, and I'm just going to sort of leave that answer right there. 
Here to discuss Keith Raniere's upcoming appeal is defense attorney Dina Dahl and Terry Austin. Terry, what's your reaction to what the, his lawyers are saying? Could there be some sort of appellate issue in Raniere's case? You know, Brian, I don't see it. As you know, for a criminal case, to win on appeal, you have to have either legal error, you have to have jury misconduct, or you have to have an assistance of counsel. And I don't see any of those things here. I will admit, though, that the judge was somewhat biased against the defendant here. At one point, he screamed, you know, you're done at the attorney. But that would have been grounds for a mistrial. I don't see grounds for an appeal. And we know for a fact, as you said in the clip, other two defendants have already pled guilty, so I don't see any grounds for appeal here. Now, Dean, maybe not turning over the entire sentence, but part of the appeal could be the years that was sentenced to. 120 years is a lot. Could they not simply say, hey, reduce it to 60 years, and would that not be a win in some way? You know, as a federal case here, there, I'm sure there was federal sentencing guidelines involved. So it's very hard to overturn the length of a sentence. The judge does have discretion, and um, they would have to show some sort of abuse with discretion, which it does not sound like they have. All right, we're going to keep eyes on this case. Uh, Terry, when we're thinking about this appeal, obviously there's going to be arguments made, but are you still feeling that the ruling will stand? You know, I think they have to make the argument because you have to do everything you can for your client. But I think the ruling is going to definitely stand. All right, of course, we're going to have uh, Joseph McBride and Stephen Metcalf come back. If there is any updates in this case, make sure to tune in here at the Law and Crime Daily. Uh, still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the no-body murder trial briefly put on pause. But first, should a convicted murderer be granted parole? His defense says he's not a danger. The prosecutor says his own life is at stake. Our exclusive reporting next. A deputy DA in Los Angeles is trying to keep a man he prosecuted for murder behind bars over threats he made to kill him and his family. But, as Anjanette Levy tells us, the man's attorney does not believe William Terry Bradford ever made the threats. Yeah, that's right, Brian. You know, Los Angeles Deputy District Attorney John Lewin has been saying for many years that William Terry Bradford threatened to kill him and his family when he first got to prison back in 2002. Bradford is now 87 years old, and the California Parole Board says he should be released from prison. But his defense attorney says that he is not a danger. I am here not as a representative of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. The opinions addressed are my own and my own only. Lewin has made a career out of prosecuting cold case murders. He's prosecuting Robert Durst for the murder of his friend Susan Berman. Lewin says Bradford, whom he prosecuted in 2002 for the murder of his wife Joan 14 years earlier, made threats to another inmate when he first got to prison. You know, I've done a lot of, of murder cases in my career, and that's the only time that I've ever had a someone I prosecuted who um, has made a threat like that, and the only time that I've ever really thought that, you know, I had a reason to be concerned. The Bradfords were in the middle of a messy divorce when Bradford shot Joan from behind in her home. Their children found their mother's body. Lewin says he and the children fear what could happen if Bradford is released. The man was willing to throw his life away at age 55 when he had a million dollar retirement. So now, you know, he's in his mid 80s with nothing to lose. And you want to parole him. I will tell you that my position is that John Lewin's fear is is absolutely not warranted. Defense attorney Maya Ebbick says that Bradford suffers from dementia and has limited mobility. She also points to polygraph test results for the inmate who claimed Bradford wanted to kill Lewin. He was deemed truthful months later when he said he did not hear Bradford threaten to kill Lewin, but had previously said Bradford wanted to kill him and his family. Here is this anomaly in, in the course of a divorce, a contentious divorce. There is this, um, this murder atrocious murder, absolutely. But Mr. Bradford was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. And that is that means just that. 
Now, after receiving those polygraph documents from attorney Maya Emig, I went back to John Lewin. He, I showed them to him, and he said that he had been under the impression since back in 2002, 2003, that that inmate passed the polygraph test when he was asked whether or not the Bradford had ever threatened to murder him and his family, and he thought that that inmate said yes. He now sees that the inmate said no, he didn't hear that, and basically recanted those statements. Now, the inmate, um, or pardon me, Governor Newsom, rather, he actually reversed the parole board's decision back in 2018 when the board said that Bradford should be released then. I contacted Newsom's office, and a spokesperson there said that they will again review this case very carefully. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Back with us is our panel, law and crime analyst Dina Dahl and co-host Terry Austin. But first, Anjanette, break this down for me. Lewin knew what, when exactly? Uh, again, he said that back in 2002, 2003, he was under the impression, and he's been under the impression the entire time, that that inmate passed the polygraph and said at the time that he had heard Bradford make these statements. He later said during that polygraph, no, he had not heard them. Lewin said he was not aware of that until we showed him the documents. So he's going to be deciding what his next step is. And this is important because John Lewin, under Marcy's law out in California, he isn't entitled to go to the parole board and say anything. Now, the children of the Bradfords have designated him as their representative, and he speaks on their behalf, and they are very fearful of their father and do not want him released. Dina, interesting turn of events. If the threats to Lewin and his family were false, what do you think the parole board will do? You know, it's interesting. Maybe the, it, you know, it sounds like he's also representing the children, and that to me seems like maybe more likely, although two years ago we know that wasn't enough, the threat to the children. So if it does turn out that this polygraph all along, you know, we know polygraphs are not reliable, but if it does turn out that he didn't actually say that threaten Lewin, then he may be released. Now, Terry, convicts rarely get released to the parole when they first are eligible. As we heard, this is not Bradford's first time. So do you think a second go around or multiple go arounds may increase his chances? Here's my view, Brian. I say keep him in jail. I know he's an older person and he may not be a threat to society because of that, but I think the parole board should err on the side of caution here. If there's any chance that he actually said, I'm going to kill you, attorney, and I'm going to kill your family as well, that's a threat to society. So I think that perhaps he should, at least for now, at least this time around, stay behind bars. All right, we'll keep eye on that. I know Anjanette is in touch with uh, D.A. Lewin, and we'll see how he uh, navigates this parole board with this new information. Thank you all. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a suspect charged with fatally hitting rapper Nicki Minaj's father and fleeing the scene. Plus, an Iowa farmer was convicted of killing his wife with a corn rake. So why does he have a fan group? A report you don't want to miss still ahead. An arrest has been made in the hit and run that killed rapper Nicki Minaj's father. Terry Austin is here with new details of the alleged driver in the fatal crash. Police in New York say that after the crash, the suspect actually got out of his car, stood over the deceased man, asked if he was okay, and then drove home. According to the Nassau County Police Department, 70-year-old Charles Polkovic turned himself in. Polkovic is also accused of parking his car in his garage to try to hide it from investigators. Robin Mirage, the father of Nicki Minaj, was struck and killed while walking along a road in Long Island around 6 p.m. last Friday. The 64-year-old was taken to a hospital and later pronounced dead. Polkovich was later identified as the driver. He's facing charges of leaving the scene of an accident with a fatality and tampering with evidence. The rogue former FBI agent convicted of aiding the infamous mobster James Whitey Bulger has been granted a conditional release from prison. John Connolly was found guilty and sentenced to 40 years for leaking information to Bulger that led to the shooting death of a gambling executive. A Florida commission voted to release Connolly, who has cancer and is believed to have less than a year to live. Bulger was serving out a life sentence for the murders of 11 people when he himself was murdered in 2018. 
family of a former NFL player found deceased in a hotel room believes he was suffering from chronic alcoholism and concussions. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office says 38-year-old Vincent Jackson was found dead by an employee of the hotel last week. Jackson played 12 seasons in the NFL, last five for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Sheriff's Office says he had checked into the hotel on January 11th and his family reported him missing about a month later. Deputies conducted a welfare check on February 12th and confirmed his well-being. No apparent signs of trauma were reported. An autopsy report is pending. Is an Iowa farmer really innocent of killing his wife with a corn rake? Chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross spoke to a woman who's on a mission to prove just that. Thanks, Brian. Coming up this week, I'm Brian Ross Investigates. Rock stars, movie stars, professional athletes all have their fan clubs. Well, so do accused and convicted killers, as we discovered as we put together a 10-part series for an A&E called Killer Cases. We focused on the case of Todd Mullis, a farmer in Iowa, convicted of killing his wife with a pitchfork. She fell on a fork. I had to look at a fork on her. It, it was very difficult to buy that story. Amy was quite unhappy and was actually thinking about leaving Todd. There were aspects of uh, an, an affair. You believe the last time you saw her that you did have some type of sexual relation. We started watching the first day and I was hooked. Todd Mullis looking at a big penalty if he's convicted. You know, the case kind of took off. It was compelling. He killed Amy. He killed Amy. I can understand why. And could not believe that this man was being tried for this. He, he couldn't have killed her. That's coming up this week, Brian, on Brian Ross Investigates on the Long Crime Trial Network. Brian? Thanks, Brian. When we come back, breaking down the testimony in a no-body murder trial, why it's put on hold, and when it will resume after the break. The trial of Wisconsin man accused of killing his wife has been put on pause while the judge recovers from an unexpected injury. James Prokopovich is charged with first-degree intentional homicide of his wife, Victoria Prokopovich. She was reported missing on April 25, 2013, and her remains are yet to be recovered. Day four, the trial was delayed after the judge broke his ankle. Testimony is expected to resume on Monday. Prosecutors have called a series of witnesses in an effort to show that the defendant purposely murdered his wife and hid her body. Friends say he failed to help search crews look for her. I went out into the woods where we searched with a group of volunteers. Okay. Do you remember how many people were volunteering? Oh gosh, probably 40, 50. We had gone outside, you know, people were coming in and out. So a lot of them had gone outside, so I went outside as well. They were smoking and just talking. I heard him say, you guys are wasting your time. She's nowhere around here. And you will never find her. And he also said, women, all they do is <laughs> And they have nothing to <laughs> about, they find it. And those were comments you recall Mr. Prokopovitz making during the first search you were at? Absolutely, those are etched in my memory. Did you observe Mr. Prokopovitz participate in any of those searches? He did not go on the searches. What was he doing that you could observe? Um, just kind of walking around a little bit, and then he was gone. On Cross, the defense pointed out that she only gave these statements in March of 2020. That's seven years after the search. I'm just curious. You, you, you made a statement. You said the statements were etched in my memory, but when the prosecution asked you about the statements, you couldn't remember them. So they really aren't etched in your memory, are they? Well, it is. But you had to refresh your memory to remember what your statements were, correct? One of them, yes. Two of them, actually. Because there's three statements, and you read two of them. Correct? Right. So there was one more, right? You remembered the first one, says so she's not around here. And then you had to get your memory refreshed for the other two, correct? I don't recall. Okay. Sorry. You've never met Jim Prokopovitz prior to these searches, correct? I have not. You've never interacted with him or know his demeanor? No. You don't know what his personality is like or how he mourns, do you? No. And him being kind of upset making these statements could be just part of his personality as being an older gentleman, correct? 
No, I, I was shocked to hear that. And since you're Stacy's friend, you're trying to help Stacy and Marshall, correct? In finding their mother, yes. No delays in analysis. Joining us is Dina Dahl and Terry Austin. Dina, as we wish the judge a speedy recovery, prosecutors were really trying to get off any excuse that Victoria just disappeared. But have they done that beyond a reasonable doubt so far? I mean, so far, I don't think they have. I mean, as we just saw right there, the defense did a really good job of poking holes into her testimony. But the delay during the prosecution's case is actually quite helpful to the prosecution because lawyers continue to work the trial during the trial. I mean, often at night, the lawyer after the trial ends, you know, tweaks the case and prepares it for the next day. So they know the holes they have in their case and they have a few days here to try to plug those holes to maybe alter the way they were going to um, interview the next few witnesses. So if anything, this pause could help the prosecution. Absolutely, but Terry, all, the defense is probably doing the same thing. And as we saw, it seemed like they almost had an answer for everything the prosecutor threw at them. Do you think that Prokopovich could walk? You know, I think this defense is one of the best teams I have seen so far. They have an answer for every single thing, and I think he could walk. So, for instance, they say he's not cold and callous. He's just unemotional. He drinks beer. He's not an alcoholic. He just works hard and has to relax at the end of the day. He didn't kill his wife because she was suicidal. So I think they really have done a great job at arguing about every single issue that the prosecution has raised so far. This is going to be an interesting summation. You got to stay tuned. Thank you both for contributing. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.